Good morning, church family. You know, I was thinking just the other day, I had a lot of time to think laying around in a hospital. Ten years ago, we lived here. And we made a decision to, uh, to move to Lubbock and, and work with Sunset there. And that was a great decision, but it's surprising to me that it's already been ten years. Um, as I get older, life just flashes by faster and faster and changes occur. And as I look around at all the kids that were so small that are now so big, in fact, both these guys being bigger than me, that's sort of crazy. But it's awesome that God's work here has just continued on, that God is continually being blessed from here. We'll see if I can gain control of the PowerPoint here. If I can't, uh, it's going to get a little different. Oh, there it goes. I think they may have done it. Um, one thing I did recently, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, was uh, I've been able, I've been blessed to have a lot of time to study. And in this time to study, I've really focused on the life of Moses. And I don't know for sure what attracted me the most to the life of Moses, but there was one moment in his life that really impacted me, one that I kept going back and, and thinking about. And that was what we read earlier from Exodus chapter number three about Moses in his older age as he was approaching 80, suddenly having something amazing happen to him. Speaking of something amazing, it's always nice how Robert takes care of all my problems. I want you to think for just a minute about what happened that day. In fact, let's go back and let's look at Exodus chapter 3. Um, it was read for us. Just want to read it again and highlight it. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush is not being burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. This text really got me thinking. Now I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a moment like that. A moment where it seemed like as you were reading through scripture, the Bible started talking directly to you. That suddenly it seemed like instead of it being written for the masses, suddenly it got really personal and you thought, God really hit me with that one. I'm sure Robert's had the experience a billion times where someone comes up to him after a sermon and said, were you talking to me? Because scripture does that. God's Word does that. And, and sometimes we have that burning bush moment where it's not just reading words on a page, but where it is something right in our face. <clears throat> have you ever felt like you've had a moment where it seemed like God was opening up a door for you to do something? Paul, inside Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through verse 6, he asked us to pray that God might open up doors for him, for opportunities to do great things, to talk to people and and all of that. Have you ever felt like maybe there was a time where God was saying, this is your chance to talk to this person, or this is your chance to go do those things? Not a subjective, silly thing, but just looking at what you can see around you. Maybe this was a burning bush type moment. Maybe a moment where you were sitting there and something either wrong or something was being said, and you thought, you know, God would really want me to say something right now. I really appreciated Bible class where several of your elders stood up and said something. They spoke. They addressed hard things. And that's a, 
That's a frightening thing to do, but sometimes we need to speak. We need to answer the questions that come up. I had someone just the other day come up and say, well, what do you think about this congregation in town? And they've made a decision to do this and do this and do this. And what do you think about that? And it's a moment where God says, I need somebody to say what I would say. You ever had one of those moments where it seemed like God was asking you to do something uncomfortable? You listen to a lesson, it talks about how you need to go out and challenge your close friends who aren't Christians with the gospel and, and help them to see what God says. And you go, oh, I know that's right, but wow, that is hard. I've got to go love my enemies. I've got to be faithful even during the hardest of times. And you think, okay, God, I hear what you're saying, but it's so hard for me to do. You ever had the moment where it seemed like you got a brand new chance? You got a chance to start all over? That was my burning bush moment. Not long ago, I went to the doctor because I had the flu. And they found that, um, they said, you may have some aches and pains. I went home and I kept telling Brenda, I've got an ache and a pain. And whenever she looked at it, she said, we're going back. So we went back to the doctor and it turned out I had a thing called cellulitis. Um, something was inside my skin, uh, affected me. And that was really bad, so they put me in the hospital to give me medicines. And then it got worse, uh, got sepsis. Uh, my blood was poison going all over my body and it got really bad for a while. And I remember laying in ICU for a number of days and I remember uh, coming out of that and then one day, Brenda got pneumonia in the middle of this, which I thought was pretty selfish, but she got pneumonia in the middle of this and uh, taking care of her husband wound her down and I was laying in a bed, my, my good friend Tim Burrow was from Ukraine and now home was sitting there in the room with me. I had a lot of babysitters it seemed like. And the doctors came in and said, this is the point where we tell you what you've been through. The first statement was, Chris, honestly, you should not be here. They told me uh, about a, a Tuesday where my heart raced too much, my blood pressure was too bad, my temperature was too high, the, uh, disease, the poisoned blood was getting me too much, and they said that should have been the day it was over. And I thought in my head that that would mean Friday would have been my funeral. And it was an interesting moment. Now maybe some of you have had a moment like that, where you go, wow. And I remember looking at Tim and going, so what do I do? What happens now? And I told the doctor, did God leave a pamphlet or something? Did he drop something off that says, this is what you do now at this moment? I don't know. If I told God, if you want me to preach again, tell me. And I'll, I'll quit this and I'll go back to full-time preaching. If you want me to move back to Ukraine, I'll go. If you want me to move to Africa, I'll go. You've got to find some way of telling me. But the bush just sat and burned and I didn't have that voice come with it. But it was a moment where I decided, if God's going to bless me this way, God, whatever you want, that's what we're going to do. And I'm grateful for a new chance. I was really grateful to hold my grandbaby again. Just in case you're interesting, the grandbaby is sitting right back here inside this section at the back. But you know, that moment has passed. Now I've been walking around for a while, going back to regular life some, and you start to lose that feeling. You start to not hear the crackling of the fire in the bush. Things go back to normal and you begin to say, okay, God, I know I told you I would do whatever you say, but, and excuses begin to start. Sometimes we just don't feel we can do the things God tells us to do. We see something in scripture and we go, okay, I know that's true, but I just don't really feel that I can do that right now. Sometimes we aren't comfortable. 
Sometimes we say, okay, I, I should do that, but I'm not comfortable doing those things. Sometimes we just don't want to do it. We say no. No, I do not want to do it. I was in Boston, Massachusetts doing a series of lessons on how to teach your neighbors about Christ. And this one woman said, Chris, no matter what you say, I'm not going to do it. And I said, okay, but don't you worry about your neighbors and all this? She goes, absolutely. So you better come to my neighborhood because I'm not going to do it. And sometimes we do that. I was having a Bible study with a man there in Boston and got to the end. He said, okay, I know I should be baptized, but that would be admitting I'm wrong and I'm not going to do it. Sometimes we act that way with God. Sometimes we make excuses. I'm not good enough. Who am I to do something like that? I'm not talented enough. I don't have that kind of gift to do those particular things. And, and I'm so busy. Life is so fast and full right now. I can't do the things God would ask me to do. And in my heart of hearts, I'm a little scared to do it. That same moment it said she absolutely would not do it. Finally, she looked up and she said, I'm just scared. Do you ever get scared? I said, oh, every time. Every time. But you have to get to the point where you can overcome even your fear. Or maybe we think someone else could do it. Moses would understand all those feelings. In fact, Moses went through all those different emotions when God said, I've got a job for you. Remember back when you lived in Egypt and you lived in the palace and all those things? It's time to go back. I want you to be the deliverer. You to be the one that brings my people home to the mountain so I can tell them what things I expect of them and how much I love them and care for them. You're the one. I want you to do these things. And the first response of Moses wasn't, finally, you asked me. I'm ready to go. I want to do this. It was, oh, hold on. I'm not that guy. I don't know how you could ask me this. You know the story of Moses. For 40 years, he lived in Egypt. A decree was sent out to kill all the babies and, and baby boys, and his, his mother put him in a basket, set him out on the Nile. His, his sister watched from the bulrushes, and, and all these things happened. He was found by the princess, and she brought him in to live inside Pharaoh's own house, and they hired his mama to take care of him, and she taught him Hebrew culture and the things of God and, and all that. At the same time, he's getting the best education imaginable inside Egypt's palace. Egypt was the kingdom of knowledge, and he was getting to drink all that in. He had the best of everything, but he grew up knowing his family and knowing his heritage, and, and one day he saw one of his own people, a Hebrew, being beaten, a slave being beaten, and he said... I am the one who's been put in position to save them all. I will stand up and I will deliver. I will, and he kills a man, buries a man. He finds out he's, it's been discovered. And he runs. And he hides. And his life changes. He finds himself in Midian. Midian is a far cry from Pharaoh's palace. It was called the wilderness in the wilderness. It was the desolate place in the middle of a desolate place. You had to take sheep for miles sometimes during a day to find enough grass and water just to get them through to the next day. It was a really hard place to live, and it's where he went to hide. He went to the place where no one would look for you, and he went to Midian, and there he met Jethro, and, and he met the daughters, and he ended up marrying one of them, and ended up having a son, and his life was living among his father-in-law's sheep, taking them from place to place, shepherding them. And on one day, he happened to turn his head, and there was a bush, a flame. He had a choice. He could either look and go towards it, or he could walk away. And, and God just stops. 
And it says when he turned towards it, then God began to speak to him. And, and God talked to him about what he needed to do. And we read that just moments ago. After 40 years in Midian, 40 years of caring for not his sheep, but his father-in-law's sheep, 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness, which is very, going to be a very good picture of what's going to happen to him later. Instead of ba-ba sheep, he's going to start having grumbling sheep among the Israelite nation in the wilderness. But he comes to this moment where God says, I want you to be the one to deliver the people. And inside his mind, he's going, I ah, see, I tried that and everything went wrong. Now I'm a fugitive. Now I'm a laughing stock. Now I'm the least person you should want to go back to Egypt. And God said, you're the one. God told Moses he would deliver his people from Egypt. And Moses is probably thinking, man, when I was 40, I thought I could do it. But then everything fell apart. God had a mission. What did Moses have? Excuses. Reasons why he couldn't do the mission God gave him. The first excuse he asks is basically, but who am I to do these things? You ever felt that way? Well, okay, these things need to be done, but, but who am I? And that's what he asked of God. He, God said, I want you to go deliver my people. And he goes, now, do you know who you're talking to? Do you remember my story? Who am I to go back to Egypt? to go back to the people I left, to go back to the people I ran from. Who am I to go back to them, now the shepherd instead of the prince? Who am I to go do those things? God answers, that's not the point. The point is, I will be with you. It won't just be you. It will be you and God doing these things. I'm going to be right there with you. You're going to be speaking for me and I will be there with you and I will help you do the thing I asked you to do. That's true of us as well. You ever feel like you're saying, but who am I? But who am I to stand up and say that what they're doing is wrong? Or who am I to stand up and say that you need to change whatever you're doing? Who am I to be the one to do those things? Second excuse was, but do I really know enough? Do I know enough to do these things? Chapter 3, verse 13, he says, okay, I, I could do that, but, but I don't know what to do. And how are they supposed to know? And, and how, how is this all going to work together? And God said, if you know my name, you know me. He said, but how do I even know you and what to do? And how are they going to know that, that you really sent me? And he goes, and what are they going to ask? And he said, if you know my name, you know me. What's his name? I am that I am. I am always present. I'm always there. I am the one that always lives inside that circumstance. I'm the one there in every moment of life, in every place in life. I am the continual present being. Just as he was there that moment with Moses, he is there this moment with us because he just is. And whenever we turn a million pages in the story of our life, he is there. He said, you tell them who I am. You ever feel like that? But do I know? Do I know God? Do I know him well enough to tell other people? It's a question we ask, and sometimes we offer the same excuse. The next question is, but well, why would they believe me? Do you remember who I am? Why would they believe me when I came back and said, oh, God told me to do this? What if I came to you guys today and said, God gave me a special message. God talked talk to me and told me and and all these things. Or Scott, I've got a special message for you that God gave me. You'd be looking at me like I'm a crazy man. And Moses is going, what am I supposed to do? Go back and tell them those things. And God says, it's not about what you can do. It's about what I can do. 
show them the things I can do. And he talked to him about putting his hand in his cloak and pulling out wide, about throwing down a staff and about turning water to blood. And he said, you don't worry about your credentials. My credentials are strong. Recently, I was having a Bible study with a person and I said, let me just talk about how powerful God is. And we went back through and looked at all the miracles and those things. And it was an amazing thing for them. Those miracles and all are great proofs of God's power, just as they were during the time of Moses. Verse 10, chapter 4, he says, maybe you don't know this, but my tongue doesn't work as well anymore. I can't speak well enough. I don't have the talent for that. I'm not able to do that the same way anymore. I'm, I'm not that one. I don't have all the giftedness I need. And God said, I know exactly what you are. I made you. I know what gifts you have. I'm the one that put them in you. I wouldn't ask you to do this thing if you weren't able to do it. And, and don't assume because you don't believe in yourself that I don't believe in you. I know you can do this. He made his tongue. You ever doubt your abilities? God's not asking us to do things we can't do. Finally, Moses just says, can't you find someone else to do this? Isn't there someone who can do these things? And God said, let's get you some help and then you can get started. There's your brother Aaron. Take Aaron with you. And sometimes this is the answer. When we just don't think we can go forward, maybe we just need to find someone to do it with us. Do you ever feel like you can't do it by yourself? That's why God placed us in his church. Moses had all sorts of excuses. But in the end, he obeyed God. God doesn't judge us for our hesitation. He judges us for our eventual action. God asks us to do so much. And the question is, after the excuses are offered and, and we realize God answers, are you willing to do what He says? God speaks to us today. In times past, He spoke to us by prophets. Then He began to speak through His Son. Then He spoke to those who would write His Word, the New Testament. And He still speaks. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through about verse number 9, talks about how God speaks to us. Paul says, I received revelation. I received a complete understanding from God of what He needed you to know. I, I had His Word revealed to me. By inspiration, I wrote it down. And when you read these words, you can understand my insight into the Gospel of Christ. When we read, we can understand. We still have God speaking to us today through Scripture. Are you obeying what He asked you to do? I hope so. Are you still making excuses? That person I was studying with, I know I need to be baptized. It's obvious. You've made it crystal clear. In fact, every person that ever came to Christ in the New Testament came in the exact same way. He goes, I know that's what I need to do, but I've been married to my wife all this time and she's been telling me I need to be baptized and I don't want to say she's right and I'm wrong, so I'm just not going to do it. I'll just take my chances. Seems crazy to me. When the Bible's so clear in what you ought to do, you ought to just do it. He has a choice. Are you going to obey or are you going to make excuses? And he chose making excuses. Maybe there's someone here that's had this same battle. Okay, I get it. If you don't believe and baptize, or if you believe and are baptized, you shall be saved. But if you disbelieve, you're condemned. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Acts 2.38, now why do you delay? If you're baptized into Christ Jesus. You receive forgiveness of your sins. You get the Holy Spirit. 
Acts 2.39, for this will be the same for you, for your children, for your children's children, all those who are far off, as me as Lord our God will ever call to Himself. But who am I? But how can I do this? But what should I do? Are you still making excuses? We have a charge to raise our children. Raise our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to teach them the things they need to be taught to help them understand God's law and God's will for their lives. I was talking to someone the other day and they said, well, you know, you can't make an 11-year-old go to church. And I said, you've never met my father. He was a king of it. He delivered me before God. He raised me up. He instructed me. He cared for me. He did all those things. Even whenever it wasn't so easy to do, are you going to raise your children in a godly way or are you going to make excuses? Well, he's a pretty stubborn kid. I'm sure my parents said that too. We obey or make excuses and it's our choice. This is a picture of our AIM Adventures and Missions students, the team that lived in uh, Bolivia. Every day they would make sandwiches and make food and go out among the, the poor people in the streets and give them and then teach them. Here they are beside a construction site giving some food to a, to a little toddler that's there with his daddy. They, in the next couple of hours, taught this man the gospel, was baptized into Christ. Now he's got his family growing them up in the Lord's church. But are you going to obey God's demand that we talk to others about Christ? That we share the gospel with others? It's a choice we've got to make. God's already said His part. He demands that we do that. Now you've got to decide, are you going to obey what God asks or will you make excuses? Sharing the gospel with your friends. <coughs> are you going to obey God's demands or are you going to make excuses that maybe you're not talented enough or maybe you don't know enough or all those things, just like Moses did years ago. This is a picture of a special congregation. See, my laser pointer works. Can you see this guy right here? His name is George Tingbaugh. George is the director of Sunset School in Riala, Liberia. I was there not too long ago, and while I was there, I, I didn't know much about Ebola. When I went into the country, there were big banners all over the airport, and when you were going in to get your passport stamped, there was a sign that said, warning, you're entering an Ebola zone. You're entering a place where Ebola is growing. And I remember sitting there with my passport in my hand going, uh, maybe I should have studied up on this kind of stuff before I came here. But I handed in my passport, I went out, joined with my brothers, we, we had a good time in Monrovia and all those things that went out to Weala. And Weala is very close to the area where the Ebola strain started in Liberia. And George Tingba here, has already lost nine of his brothers and sisters who worked in the health field, who were doctors and nurses, who have died as they've treated Ebola patients. And this congregation in our school used to have about 80 people, but there have been so many deaths as people continue to fall. And I remember standing there as they had dead bodies and they would spray them with uh, bleach and other chemicals to basically just eat their body away. And as I sat and watched these things, I went to George and said, I gotta get out of here. I gotta go home, this is horrible. And he said, yes, I understand. And I was on one of the last planes that got to leave. And... But the church is growing. They're continuing to reach out. They are reaching out to the families of those who have suffered. His brothers and sisters set up a clinic in their house and brought people in and ministered to them, even if it meant their own demise. Are we going to obey the things God asks us to do, even when it's hard? Or are we going to make excuses?
There are people who give up everything to do the things God would say. Are we going to go and help them? Are we going to spread the gospel around the world? Are we going to give them those things? And, and I know your answer is yes. I know that, that you go and help in these things. It comes down to something really simple. We may not see a literal burning bush. In fact, I'll pretty much guarantee you, you'll never see a bush like the one Moses saw that day. Now, I've seen bushes on fire. I just haven't seen one that continually sustains itself. But in our lives, we all have those moments where we go, all right, I know what God wants me to do. All right, I understand now that I'm supposed to do this, that I've got to do these things. That's our burning bush moment. That's the time where we see that God opened up a door for us or God gave us something to do or we have a responsibility. There's something I can do for God. The question is, in that moment, have you been doing those things or have you been making excuses? Have you set those things aside? That's the question of the hour. And the answer is, our whole duty is to obey God in those moments. If you aren't a baptized believer in Christ Jesus, and you know that God has said that that's something you need to do, what excuses do you have? I don't know enough. You don't know enough to be a baby? You don't know enough to start over? Well, I, I just don't want to. That's your choice. But God expects us to obey what He says. We're supposed to go talk to people about God. We're supposed to love our neighbors. We're supposed to pray for our leaders. We're supposed to do so many different things. This morning, I want you to think about how this is our opportunity. This is our chance to start right now, just doing the things that God would ask us to do, to throw our excuses aside and do those things. If you've never been baptized into Christ Jesus, stop giving excuses and do what God would ask you to do. If you're not living a faithful Christian life where you work, where you go to school, or in all the things that you do, don't make excuses. Just decide to start living the way God would have you live. If you need help with that, we stand ready to help you this morning. We'll pray for you, baptize you into Christ, um, pledge ourselves to help you as you face the problems that you face, whatever you need. Well, let's take this moment to decide to not give excuses. Well, let's decide to give our faithfulness and be the type of people we're called to be. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation of Christ, we ask you to come to Jesus as we stand and as we sing.